Praise the Lord. It's my privilege to greet you this morning. And we are here once again to rejoice in the God of our salvation. My prayer is that you will truly engage with the Lord, whether you're on your own in your own home or you're seated with other family members. Let's together exercise our faith, come right into the presence of God immediately and enjoy a time of praise and worship. Whatever you do as we walk through this service, prepare your heart to receive the word because God will speak powerfully into our lives today. Enjoy this great service of celebration. God bless you. Open the 
your people, oh God. We welcome you. We invite you. Be enthroned on the praises of your people.
overcame death and you brought victory into our lives. We honor you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Father, we thank you. Everlasting God, we thank you. King of kings and Lord of lords, we thank you. We give you all the glory, Father. We give you all the adoration. We give you all the thanks given for bringing every one of us to this time of another morning, another Sunday morning. The grace to worship you, we thank you for it. The grace to know you as our Father, our God, our Lord, our King and Maker. Today, Father, we bring so many things before you. Oh, yes, there is trouble in the Holy Land. We pray for Israel. We pray for the peace of Israel. We pray also for the Palestines. We pray, Lord, that you will touch the hearts of these warring children, children of Abraham, that, Lord, you will touch their hearts with an ointment of peace. That, Lord, whatever issues they may have, issues of hatred, issues of resentment, issues of animosity, that, Lord, you will melt their hearts. You will cause them to see reason so that there will be peace in Israel. This is our prayer this morning, Father. Oh, yes, Father, there are problems in countries like my country, Nigeria. The Fulanese, the bandits, the kidnappers, they're all over the place causing havoc and trying to bring destruction to the country that we call Nigeria. Lord, we bring Nigeria before you this morning. We ask that you intervene. Oh, Father, help us in our country. We ask for healing. Healing for countries where the COVID-19 pandemic is still very prevalent. Countries like India. Now we hear of the Indian strain or the Indian variant. Lord, we understand that these are spread to neighboring countries like Nepal, like Pakistan, like Sri Lanka, all across Asia. Eternal rock of ages. You are the God Almighty that heals. You are Jehovah Rapha, the God Almighty that heals us. By the stripes of your son, Jesus Christ, we are healed. Oh, yes, we call upon you now to intervene in this country, Father. Intervene in this country. Bring healing to these lands so that these deaths that in our human eyes we consider senseless can stop. Father, we ask you, have mercy on this country. Have mercy in our country, United Kingdom, too, because we know that this Indian variant is now here. Father, we pray for wisdom for our doctors, for our scientists to find a solution. And Lord, we pray for spiritual solution that you hear our prayers to heal our land. Oh, yes, Lord, we are planning to go back to our building. We pray, Lord, for wisdom for our leaders. Father, Lord, yes, we ask that we be a channel of blessing to those in need. Amen. Things like you do, God, I look to you. 
church is my honor. To the angel of the church is my honor. Right. These are the words of him who is first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches, he who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. 
May the Lord bless his reading today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. This is message two in the series, Letters to Seven Churches from the Book of Revelation. I hope that you were able to listen to the first one that I preached last week that was sent to the church in Ephesus. I remind you that the challenge to that church was that they had fallen from their first love. As we now look at the second and the shortest of the letters, it is a really tough message. But we know that we cannot dodge the hard message. We have times when we receive incredible messages of joy and truth that stimulate our hearts and cause fire to burn in us for the love and the love of God. But there are times when we have to look at the hard message, the hard message that challenges us in times that are tough. And this is one of those messages. But hang on in there because the end of the message is truly remarkable. So let's walk through it together. So this is to the church in Smyrna. And the church in Smyrna was known as the poor but rich church. And the reason for that is because they were living again in a serious time of dark persecution. And the judgment was to the point where they were not even allowed to hold any personal possessions couldn't own own land, couldn't have houses. And so they were living with absolutely nothing. And if you looked at their life and their position through the natural eye, you would say they were in extreme poverty, owning nothing. But if you saw through the eyes of Jesus and what Jesus could see in these people, he saw they were the richest people in that town. So you may have somebody who is not a follower of Jesus, who has confessed Caesar as God and uh, submitting to the Roman law, uh, and they're living in what would be described as a palace. And yet right next door to that palace, there could be a tin shack. And living in the tin shack, is a faithful believer who is suffering for the gospel and the persecution, unwilling to bow the knee to Caesar and proclaim him as God. And so they were viewed as a traitor and they were often tried and condemned. And yet living in that tin hut, there was the wealthiest person in the community. Why? Because of the riches of the Lord Jesus Christ that were part of their life and had dropped into their heart through his amazing grace. And so as we look at this message, we can see immediately that Christ is saying, I went to the cross for you. I suffered for you. And I am empathizing with what you are going through right now. And that is even seen in the very name of the town, Smyrna which means bitter. And from that word, we get the word used to describe the perfume that was popular in that day, myrrh. Can you remember when the three wise men visited Jesus at his birth or later on? They came and they brought gold, frankincense and myrrh. It's myrrh that was a sign that Jesus would lay down his life in death for the whole world because myrrh was used as an embalming fluid. So it pointed that death would come. But thanks be to God through his resurrection now and through who Jesus is and what he's done, although these beautiful believers have no material wealth whatsoever, they are rich in God. Wow, how awesome. But they were suffering. They were persecuted because they were absolutely committed to following Jesus and being true disciples. Well, if we compare Ephesus and Smyrna, you will know that both places were 
built on the coast. They were both seaports. But if you went back there today, you would find that Ephesus does not even exist. It is a ruin. But if you go to Smyrna, you will find it is still present and it is known as the town of Izmir. I wonder why that is. The challenge to the church in Ephesus was to return to their first love. Perhaps they didn't. And maybe that's why it's in ruins today. And that church does not exist. But if you go back to Smyrna, you will find there is a a community and there will be believers in that location and in that region. Maybe it's because those faithful people had sacrificed their life and maintained their first love for Jesus in that location in those early church days. Because what happened in the early church days in terms of missionaries and outreach and sending was absolutely vital and affected the church that we are today. And so as we look at it, we can see that Smyrna is a place where if you are a Christian, it may well cost you your life. Remember I said that there are people who say that Each church and each letter represents a period in church history. I would say this to you. If this church represents a period in church history, surely it would have to be the early church because the level of persecution that they went through was indescribable in human language. So as we move towards the main part of this message Before we look at the letter, I want to remind you of three things that Jesus said to John as he spoke to him and walked among the lampstands. This is what he said. Write these three things down. Write down what you see, which is the vision he was seeing in the spirit. Write down what you see in the spirit. Secondly, write down what is now. What is now? The spiritual current position of the church at that particular time. What condition was this church in? Smyrna. And then write down what will take place later. The fulfillment of the prophecy of everything that God has purposed and preordained, write it down and make it plain. And it's there in this amazing book called The Revelation. But I want to take these two elements and apply them to the church that we're looking at today, the church in Smyrna. So I want to talk about what is now for them, And what will take place later for them? Because if you look at these things, you will have a deeper picture and understanding of just what the believers were walking through at that particular moment in time. Well, let me begin with what is now for these believers? Well, what was now for these believers in Smyrna was all-consuming, life-threatening, They were under persecution by pagan Gentiles. They were under persecution from hostile Jews, who the Bible says here were really no Jews at all because they were not living for God. And they also said to be under persecution from Satan himself. Now, we know for a fact that Satan predominantly persecutes the Christians through false religion and through demonic attack. And so it is false religious people who are the main persecutors of the Christians. And we still see that around the world today. 
And it breaks your heart when you see it on the TV or you read of stories of the church that has been burnt down with believers that have been locked inside or imprisoned for their faith and, and tortured and persecuted, massacred and killed. Friends, come on, let's wake up as a church and recognize these things are still happening right around the world. And we're having a soft time in comparison with so many believers. Keep praying, my friend, for the persecuted church right around the world. And for the right now, the here and now for this church, they were actually being persecuted by Satan through people. And there's little wonder that into this context and the life that they are facing, Jesus begins with words that are absolute eternal. And they are words that link with their suffering. Because he actually begins to say, in this darkest hour for you, I want to remind you of this amazing thing. This is what he says. These are the words. These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. And in that very statement, Jesus is saying, don't forget my people, the suffering I went through, the persecution and torture I went through. And the death that I died, I died for you, that you might live. And I rose again, and I am the one who is speaking to you now in this moment of extreme poverty and suffering. Here I am speaking to you with the voice of eternity. I am he that liveth, that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and forever. And so in turning to what Jesus says, we find in verse 8, these are the words. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. And then in verse 9, we have that reoccurring statement from last week when I preached about God knowing. God knew the deficiency in that church in Ephesus. He knew of the good elements, the godly elements of that church in Ephesus. But it's interesting here, he says, I know of your afflictions and poverty. In other words, no one goes through anything in life without Christ being conscious of what they're facing. And I want to remind you that whatever you are facing right now, whatever you are handling in your life, whether there's bitterness, sorrow, pain, whether you've been wounded, hurt, and whatever you are going through, even in this pandemic, you have a God who knows and understands. And I believe you'd want to bring these eternal words into your own heart. I am the one who is the first and the last. I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I know what you are facing and I know what you are going through. Just as he knew what these believers were facing and going through. So he is also watching over your life. And so it's interesting. Jesus doesn't bring any rebuke, any correction or any accusation to these people. I think because of what they're going through and have already gone through, they are spiritually on fire for God. And they are so devoted and laying life down for him, they are living a godly, pure Christian life. And actually part of their arrival at that place has come because of what they're facing and what they're going through. He only brings encouragement. And so to the church where he says, I know your afflictions and I know your poverty. He then says, and yet you are rich. How can a person be in extreme absolute poverty where they hold no possessions personally? And yet God can say you are rich. 
Can you remember when we did the study in Ephesians and last week I talked about it? The Ephesian uh, theme, the main theme, is the riches of God in Jesus Christ. And yet they became spiritually poor because they lost their first love. But now we have the opposite situation here for these Christians in Smyrna who have materially nothing. And yet they are living under the wealth and the riches of the favour of Christ. How incredible that really is. Our measurement of wealth is not right. If we could see through the eyes of Jesus, we would be reminded of what it says in that great verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, which says, and it describes the believers here so well, sorrowful, yet rejoicing, poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, and yet possessing everything. Hallelujah. Don't we need to hold material things lightly? Don't we, make sh- don't we need to make sure that we don't build wealth for ourselves, but to be giving people who h- rightly handle the blessings that God has given, that we'd be good stewards for the glory of God. And so for the believers in Smyrna, the what is now was persecution. Persecution from the Roman authorities, persecution for the Jews who despised the Christians, persecution from Satan himself. And so we can see that the strong words that Jesus speaks are actually rightly said because he describes what is going on in the realm of the spirit, bearing in mind that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. The battle is in the realm of the spirit. And and John is seeing in the realm of the spirit and perceiving what is happening here. And so Jesus says these words, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews, but they are not. They are of the synagogue of Satan. In other words, these believers were living such a beautiful, pure life that actually any accusation or any discrepancy they could be accused of was a lie. And so They were living a pure life before the people. And so only lies could bring persecution. Then I want to speak about what would take place later in the lives of these believers. And this is the hard message. Having gone through all this, Jesus then has to say, even tougher times are yet to come. And so verse 10 says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Elsewhere, if we study, we can learn that the term 10 days actually just refers to a brief moment in time. Thank God for that. When we read of that, when we see how these people have been dealt with in life and how tough it is to follow Christ and to to maintain faith and and to be faithful. In the natural, we would want to ask the question, why does Jesus not step in? The one who is all powerful, all knowing, could he not change the future and release and deliver these believers? Because we've seen him, seen God do that miraculously in times past in biblical history. But this is a different moment in time. And the answer has to be because what they are going through is for the furtherance of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God in his all knowing is somehow going to turn this to the advantage of the kingdom of God. And whilst it meant such heartache and suffering for those people, in the bigger picture of God's plan and purpose, they will receive the crown of life in glory for what they went through and what they faced. Can we say even in our generation today, 
that would be true of thousands upon thousands of Christians who have faced martyrdom because of their faith. And maybe the prisoner in the cell would cry out at times saying, Lord, how come? How could this happen? Here I am in this place where I'm locked in a cell because of faith in you. Come and deliver me. But there's no immediate answer. And so that person, great is your reward in heaven. I think about men like Watchman Nee, the great author who has penned so incredible books on spiritual life and development. Titles such as What Shall This Man Do? Love Not the World were penned in a prison cell because of his faith. And the thousands of people who've read those books and had an encounter with Jesus, I could say would be immeasurable throughout the generation certainly had a massive impact on my study life. Friends, this generation, I believe with all my heart, will yet face great trials and tribulation. And we will know it need to draw on the riches and the wealth that God has poured into our life and the knowledge that we carry. How does this happen? Can you recall the occasion when Saul of Tarsus, who was the persecutor of the church, was standing guarding the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen, who was a man committed to God, described as being absolutely full of the Holy Spirit. And Saul was stood there condoning the death. And yet, we travel on a little bit further in Saul's life and he has that Damascus Road experience and Jesus appears to him also and says, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. And, and Saul has such an encounter with God. He's born again. He's taught by the Spirit and he becomes the preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles from a persecutor to a preacher. And yet, if you look at his life, he would be able to look back and perhaps this was the thorn in his flesh, remembering how he persecuted the church and remembering that he condoned the death of Stephen, the man full of the Holy Spirit and power. That meant he kept dependent and stayed dependent upon Jesus. And so what was that? That was an event that happened which cost Stephen his life. But the result was the Apostle Paul encountered Christ and stayed close to Christ and I think ever recognised his absolute weakness and dependence upon God himself because of what he had done. And so we don't know the stories the thousands and millions of stories of those who've sacrificed their lives for Jesus and the effect that is had down through the generations. We honour their faithfulness in Jesus' name. And you may be going through many dark things yourself. And I want to say this to you this morning. God knows. What a statement in these letters. God knows. He understands. We don't, but he does. And if we can trust him this morning, we know he will complete fully everything he has purposed for our life. Isn't it good to know that nothing can take us from this life until that appointed time that God has set for us to draw our last breath? Well, friends, the challenge for this church in the persecution they were living through, was to remain faithful, even to the point of death. The important thing, be faithful, even if the government try you for treason and say your life is going to be terminated. If that happens, there will be the crown of life for you. 
Hallelujah. I love that statement, the crown of life in this letter. Actually, it will have had tremendous significance for the believers in Smyrna because the actual location was known as a place that was involved in great games and sporting life. Maybe there'd been occasion when they'd won the victor's crown. But when Jesus said it, it was at a level that was eternal. Hallelujah. If you remain faithful, If you lay down your life, there remains for you a victor's crown. By overcoming, the victor's crown would be yours. And you would never face the second death in the lake of fire. The security of eternity was theirs because they were laying down their life in sacrifice to Jesus. So when the word says, Let the church hear what the Spirit is saying. For this church, the message was, it was going to cost you everything. And friends, that message still stands today. Although we are not going through dark times of persecution, they may well come. And that message would resonate right now in our hearts. Lord, empower us and allow us to be faithful, to honour you even to the point of death. Nobody knows how we would be if we faced that type of attack, but we do hear the word of the Lord says his grace is sufficient for us and grace is given for those moments only God can bring us through. But for these saints, the closure of the letter is beautiful. They are recognized as being spiritually wealthy. And because they are sacrificing and being faithful to God in all things, they've heard what the Spirit is saying to the church. Even in death, remain faithful to me. For you will overcome and you will receive the crown of life, the victor's crown. May God bless you through this word. Even though it's been a hard word to deliver, I pray that it will cause a new passion to be faithful to God in all things for his glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you, Father, for reminding us about the importance of your church. And we understand and we know that in some places your church is suffering persecution. There is opposition of some form, even in our country, Lord. But we pray for our brothers and sisters in those places where there is severe restrictions, even to the gathering or the coming together as a church, to help and protect your children in those places, Father. Father, we are grateful for the presence of your Holy Spirit. And as we celebrate Pentecost today, Thank you for sending the Comforter to us. Father, may your love and may the presence of your Holy Spirit surround our brothers and sisters in those places where there is persecution and reveal to them the warmth of your embrace and your love and your provision, Lord. Father, we also pray for our congregation, for the church in this land, as we are planning to reopen again. Give us your wisdom, Father. Give us an understanding of your purposes after all these months of lockdown and isolation. Help us to understand what your purposes are. And Father, by your power, enable us to continue being the witnesses that you want us to be to bring the gospel of salvation to many. Give us those opportunities and give us the understanding to see every circumstance that come our way to share the good news of salvation and also help us to continue discipling the nations as we look forward to the day when people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue will celebrate your name and will glorify your name 
singing holy, holy, holy. How great is your name. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. We praise your name. In Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.
Friends, it's been a joy to have you with us today. Thank you for tuning in to our YouTube service. And we will be online next Sunday, be assured of that. Well, don't forget, we are also opening up our building in Station Road for live in-person services next week. Isn't that exciting? And we're really looking forward to that. And I hope that you've been able to book your seat and I look forward to welcoming you personally. As we close the service today, you'll be able to watch a DVD on how to book your seat. And I hope that you will be personally present as we begin to celebrate together physically in the house of the Lord. Well, I pray in the name of Jesus that his love, his joy and his peace will overwhelm you today. And that even though we've had to look at a hard subject in our preach, that you will personally know the joy and the strength of Jesus. And we look up rather than down. We look ahead to the finishing line and we know that we can rejoice in the hope of glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're excited to have you join us on Sunday. We've put all possible measures in place to ensure that you have an enjoyable and safe experience when attending one of our services. In line with current government guidance and to assist the NHS Test and Trace service, we need you to register and book your place in advance. We will keep a secure and temporary record of your details for 21 days. Booking your place is easy. Just follow this four-step process. You will receive an email inviting you to book your space for a service. When you open the email, simply click Accept if you are planning to attend that week. If you want to find out more about booking online, building safety measures, what it is like to attend a service, or whether it is safe for you to personally attend, you can click the More Information link in the email to visit our website. We have detailed guidance for all of these areas. If you don't see your email, make sure you check your spam or email us at sunday at hic Org to request your booking email. Once you have clicked Accept, you will be directed to the booking page. Verify that your personal details are correct and then choose which service you would like to attend. Please make sure you read, understand and accept that your details will be kept for 21 days. When attending with other members of your household, you have the chance to add their names into your booking by simply clicking Add Additional Ticket. We need to know exactly who is coming and every person needs to have their own booking. In a group booking scenario, each member will receive an email to let them know they have a confirmed space at the service. Finally, click proceed. You will then be shown a page which will confirm your details and the details of others attending with you. If everything looks correct, please click confirm. A confirmation email will be sent to you informing you that your seat or seats have been reserved. We encourage you to act as fast as possible as we need to adhere to social distancing guidelines and therefore seating is limited. Spaces will be allocated on a first come first served basis and only people with a valid registration will be allowed into the building. When you arrive on Sunday morning, a member of our team will check you in using the registration you completed online. Please do not forget to bring your face covering and follow social distancing measures at all times. Lastly, when planning to attend, please consider your current health conditions and relevant advice from your GP or the NHS. If you have any questions or queries or need to change some details regarding your bookings, you can email sunday at hic.org and we'll be happy to help you.